All right, and welcome back to the Spone Trained Personal Development Podcast. Uh, this is the first interview I've done in a little over a year, and I'm super excited for my guest, who is James Tripp, the author of Hypnosis Without Trance. I was just telling him that I am finishing up reading it for the second time in a row. Um, there's only been a few books in my life I've done that, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to have you on. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you very much for having me on, Nicholas. Really appreciate it. Yeah, so I I saw you speak at Hypno Thoughts Live uh, two years ago, whenever that you know before the whole situation started, and I didn't know a lot about you ahead of time, but I I got some really I got some really good stuff from you, and and that shows up in the book, and we'll get into that. Um, but I want you to start off with in the book you started uh, talking about qigong and how you could see you know this energy was actually potentially you know the use of the mind, and and talk about that story a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, this is going back into the sort of mid late nineties and uh, I'd been bought a book by my mother on Qigong. I don't know why she bought it. It was, it was in a bargain bin somewhere in some store. Um, so that's part of the reason, but you know, at, at that point there was nothing that sort of showed me indication that I'd be interested in that. I wouldn't have picked it up myself and she wouldn't have picked it up for herself. So I don't know why she picked that book up. But I read this, I started reading this book. It was The Art of Qigong by Wong Q. Kit. And literally two pages in, I was just thinking, if what this guy says is true about this stuff, I'm in. I'm absolutely in. So it was promising that I would end up, you know, with, with vitality and strength and even psychic abilities and that kind of thing. So um, I always had an interest in that kind of thing. I was always thinking, you know, what's possible in the world? So... And I'd done some psychic development stuff before and it didn't really get me anywhere, but I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I got this book and I started to do these Qigong exercises. And I just, I mean, whether it was placebo or not, it could well have been placebo, but it absolutely was transformative for me. I'd not been in a good state of mind at the time. And maybe that's why my mama got me the book, but I felt reinvigorated, rejuvenated, you know, all of these, these good things. So I thought, well, I've got to find out more about this. And I couldn't find a Qigong class locally. So I went to this Tai Chi class because it said something about Tai Chi in the book mm -hmm. and I didn't know much about it. Anyway, I went to this class and this guy running the class, he was a proper kind of energy head, proper empty force energy head. He, he was a little really wannabe cult leader in a lot of ways, but, um, he had his, his stu senior students there, and he's throwing them about without touching them. And I'm looking at this going, what? Now, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm really, I was really attracted to this stuff, but quite skeptical at the same time, because, you know, I don't want to be a, a sucker, but I really wanted to know. So I said, can I feel that? He said, no. He said, your chi isn't strong enough yet. So I'm like, oh, okay, right. Well, anyway, so I went back. And I, I don't know how long it was. I, I watched this without being allowed to participate. But it's interesting, that idea of building expectancy, building anticipation, you know. And also, I'm getting it modeled in my mind as to what it looks like. And I was absolutely aching to try this out. Now, after probably what was a couple of months or so of showing up diligently, one day he beckoned me over to the place in the room where this happened in front of this big... Um, kind of crash mat that was put up against the wall they used to throw people against without touching them. And he got me to put my hands like this and press on his shoulder. And he kind of grounded out the, um, grounded out the force, which is a legitimate Tai Chi skill. You learn how to line your body. You can ground out the force. And he got me to push. And he said, push harder, push harder, push harder, push with all your strength. And he got me pushing and pushing and pushing until so my muscles gave out, but my, but the, the, the request was to continue to push. So it's like all my strength had gone. It was just my intention pushing just my, and then he just stepped away and I was left locked and hanging in space. And immediately I was just like, Whoa, this is nuts. My hands are completely locked. And then he started to do, and you see me doing this because I, I do this in hypnosis demonstrations. He started to pull these invisible threads and suddenly I've been pulled down to the ground and things mm -hmm. like this. Anyway, he kind of played with me and threw me about a bit, stuck me to the ground completely, like kind of crushed me to the ground and stuck me to the ground. And then he sort of slapped me in it and released it all. 
and I was free to move. Now, this was a, you know, this was not a, um, an intangible experience. It was very, very strong, very, very tangible, as real as real could be, so far as I was concerned. And, um, and I was kind of blown away by it, but I was still curious. I'm thinking, what's happened? I don't know. He's telling me it's chi. Something's happened. He's telling me it's chi. Now, I knew the feeling and the sense and sensation of it. So if my memory serves me rightly, uh, he may have done this a couple of times before I did this. But in my mind, I went home. And that evening, I was thinking about it. And I knew the feeling and I knew the sensation. I knew what it was like. And I thought, can I evoke that in myself? So I, <clears throat> I did a hand levitation for the first time ever. Now, I didn't know that this was a thing in hypnosis. I just got this chi feeling in my hand and, and let it take my arm. And my arm was drifting up and drifting up. And it was just as real and just as powerful as when this guy had done it. And then I thought to myself, well, he, he sort of released the chi. Can I do it? So I just stopped and then it was, it was gone. And I was fascinated by this. Um, and I was thinking, well, what's going on here? Have I just brought this chi out inside of me? There's this little thing that's, that, was, that was thinking about hypnosis. I didn't know anything about hypnosis at the time, apart from what we're exposed to culturally through mm -hmm. TV and movies and cartoons. But I thought, has this got something? Maybe I'm just hypnotizing myself now. Maybe this guy's just hypnotized me. So I went back to the class and I said to him, you know, is, is this got anything to do with hypnosis? And he said, well, hypnosis, in hypnosis, I remember him saying this, in hypnosis, they manipulate the chi of the mind and we manipulate the chi of the body. And I thought, well, there's, there's a kind of a non-answer. But, mm -hmm. but what, what was interesting to me was that he didn't say no. He didn't say no. So it kind of kept my, my, my thoughts wrapped around this. And then because I'd learned to release myself from it, and I was also kind of bringing a, a skeptical mindset. I was able to experience it, but I was also able to bring my critical faculty to bear upon it. I found I could go all the way into these various G experiences and really have them. And I could just step out of them like that mm -hmm. as well. When I was all the way in, I was all the way in. And when I decided I was going to step out, I could step out. And yeah, it, it, was, it was interesting. And I've, there was another time I was doing some push hands with one of his senior students. And this is before I even had the chi experience myself. And this guy was talking to one of his friends. He wasn't really paying attention to me. I was pushing hands with him. And I think he forgot that I was new. And I gave him a little push. And he just went bouncing back like, you know, 15 feet across the yeah. room. Um, and I was thinking, what, what just happened? He looked at me. He said, you know what happened? I said, no, I don't. He said, you relaxed and your chi came out, you know. So, um, so I had all these, these chi experiences and things like this. Now, I, I want to just say right now, I, I still practice Tai Chi and I still love it. And I think it's actually a great martial art. When you find the rare people that know how to use it as a martial art, I genuinely love it. I also do Muay Thai, boxing, you know, things that people these days consider to be pragmatic. And I still think that Tai Chi is every bit as good as those things, if not better. I, I do actually think it's better but that's a bias that i have um and i'm aware that with legitimate tai chi skill using contact and using touch you you can uh you can move people you can disrupt their balance you can do all sorts of things that they do not have the proprioceptive um acuity mm -hmm. to know what's happening to them so it can feel like magic so it's done with touch. You can disrupt somebody's center. You can, you can cut their root. You can do all sorts of stuff. And it, if, they're, if they're numb inside, which most people are, because they haven't developed that kind of inner acuity, it will feel like magic. And I'm also aware that when it starts to feel like magic, they can kind of add to it with their own minds. They can make it bigger in their own minds. So I, I think that when people look at these sort of empty force masters and these kinds of things, I think a lot of people go, oh, that's fake. And it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time, those things emerge from real skills. You know, a real master had some real skills and was doing some things, but the, the students became so enamored of that, they started to be taken by it. 
in, in a different way. It, it started to take over. They'd be more affected by it. And then the master gets hypnotized by what's happening and they start to believe they've got these powers that they, they never knew they had. So nobody's faking. It's just, it's a different phenomenon from the one they think. And that's why the MT force masters, you can find videos on YouTube of them picking a fight with an MMA guy and getting a battering. Yeah. It's, it's almost like mesmerism, right? I mean, mesmer in his own mind was this, was this big hero and, and some people believed it and he would just say things and they'd be cured. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. Okay. So, so amazing. So, and, and let's tie that back into the title of your book, which is hypnosis without trance. So you had these experiences, you know, and I, I, I believe in energy work. I do pranic healing and Reiki and, and I'm a martial artist as well. So I know there's definitely some validity to that, but what I usually do is I just go in through the mind to give people an energetic mm. experience. Um, you know, I kind of, kind of tie hypnosis in, but through your experiences, obviously you were never into this formal trance, right? So, so yeah. for you, I guess, what is, what is hypnosis and how do we do it without a trance for those who, who aren't familiar with this concept? Okay. So um, I guess I had those experiences early on and nobody, you know, nobody shouted sleep at me at any point and my eyes were fully open. Now, some people would say, well, you know, what the guy did was a form of induction. And I can see it when people make a case for that. However, what he really did is he just drew me into an experience, very directly into an experience. Now, the reason I came up with that title, Hypnosis Without Trance, is because I was hanging around with a lot of street hypnotists in the sort of late 2000s, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2008 mainly this was. And they were all running kind of old school hypnosis protocols. So they were getting people to push on their hands, sleep, that's right, deeper and deeper and deeper, all the way in now. And then giving the suggestions in a moment when I touch on the shoulder, you will become fully alert, fully awake, but you will be unable to remember your name and doing all of this kind of stuff. Now, this is, this is like 2007, 2008. And I'd been interested in conversational. I'd had that experience with the Qigong guy, the Tai Chi guy, um, over a decade before that. And I'd had an interest in conversational hypnosis, which I'd used as a teacher of martial arts. I used conversational hypnosis to um, assist my students in letting go of various tension patterns in their body or making adjustments to what they were doing. Um, you know, without saying, no, no, don't do that. Try and relax more. You know, none of, you know, I learned to use language yeah, course, that's a bit more sophisticated. Yeah. Um, and I was doing manual therapy as well around that time. So I was using a lot of uh, sort of Ericksonian language patterns to, as an adjunct to the manual therapy that I was doing. Um, so, so first of all, all of this, I didn't like it. As a stylistic thing. I'll admit that part of it's just a stylistic thing. I didn't like that whole sleep, deeper, deeper, deeper kind of thing. Because I found also, even from a pragmatic perspective, it was, it was kind of, I'm going to offend some people now who are probably listening to this podcast if they're into hypnosis. But in a way, there were certain people out there on the street that found it too cliche. And the fact that it was too cliche meant they couldn't take it seriously. It was too corny. It was too, you know... Um, so I just thought, I don't really want to do that stuff. And I don't really need to do that stuff. I also, I did experiments with it because I was told these things that people got happening, name amnesias, uh, hallucinations, that they were deep trance phenomena. And sometimes I do trance inductions and I would take people deep and you'd see all the classic trance analogs, they're breathing and shift, and they'd be slumped there. And I'd go for one of these deep trance phenomena, it just wouldn't happen. And then other times I'd just, go directly for the experience, suggest it, shape it directly. And it would happen. And they'd have no sign. They'd be there just going, whoa, this is incredible. There'd be no, they wouldn't have gone through this phase of looking trancey or anything like that. So that's, that's kind of what I meant when I was, when I first put that out, I was, what I was really saying is, look, everyone in the hypnosis world, you think you need to do this induction so that people respond to the suggestions. You don't. They're responding to the suggestions. If you can do the induction, they must have been responding to the suggestions that shape the induction. So if you've got somebody responding, that's kind of all you need. It's just about how you engage them. It's just about how you shape that experience directly using your language, your communication, verbal and nonverbal. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I, um, I ended up doing, partly for aesthetic reasons, 
but also because, you know, I genuinely, I kind of call out that old school trance myth that there's this particular state that is required that I, I, there's no evidence for that, that I can find. Yeah. And I, and I, uh, you know, I don't teach hypnotists. I generally teach um, entrepreneurs, the principles of what I call is, you know, just hypnotic influence. And when right. you're on the call with, you know, I do a lot of real estate. When you're on the call with a seller, you're not going to run an induction and put them into trance, right? You're going to yeah. use these, these principles of conversational uh, hypnosis and rapport and, and presuppositions and all the things we're going to get into. You mm. use those and, and they're, they're, they have a broader application than just when someone's in a trance, right? And they work just mm. the same, whether they go through a trance or not. Right. Absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, I used to work as a hypnotherapist for a while, simply because I had the skills and it was a way that I could make money for a time. But um, about four years ago, maybe five years ago now, I started working for an organization in the UK, working with military veterans, um, doing a lot of work reprocessing PTSD and this kind of thing and helping with their transition to civilian life because they all had medical discharge and didn't choose to leave the, uh, the military. Now, I didn't really change what I was doing from when I was a hypnotherapist, but I never mentioned hypnosis. Out of all the clients I saw, one time, once I mentioned hypnosis to one client, that's it. The rest of the time I didn't. And I got some real, you know, some things that I remember one time I had a client say to me, how did you do that? How did you do that? And I, I said, what? He said, I was stood by that door looking at myself on the other side of the room. I was really there. How did you do that? You know, the truth is he did it. I helped him do it. I helped him direct his attention and connect with what he needed to connect to. But it was his, you know, his neurophysiology that brought that to life for him. So you don't, you know, that was, that was something, even in the Hypnosis Without Trance book, which actually is largely based on material from about 10 years ago. I say there you need a big because to get these, these stronger um, phenomena happening. And that, is, that does often help. But I have since learned that you actually don't always need that big because um, as long as you've got somebody engaged, they've got a reason to be engaged and a reason to really immerse themselves deeply, uh, they can get interesting things happening. Mm -hmm. So let's tie in your, your kind of model of, um, you know, this wheel of belief, imagination, experience and physiology, because we haven't directly yeah. talked about it yet, but, but the stories you're telling, they're, they're weaving these in. So how do we weave in? belief, imagination, experience, and physiology into the work we're doing. Okay. So, I mean, you're always working with beliefs. You cannot not work with beliefs. Right. Uh, I had this discussion with Anthony Jackwin, who's a friend of mine. He, he sort of he, says, you don't need beliefs. You just need, you know, you need focus and concentration, all of this. And my counter to that is, well, nobody shows up without beliefs. So beliefs are always at play. And being aware of those beliefs is is kind of useful because it helps you work with it. And people are going to imagine according to what they believe. They're going to move their mind according to their beliefs about how the world works and all of this kind of thing. So um, the top box in my loop is, is beliefs. People have beliefs. They have beliefs about the world in general. They have beliefs about themselves, but they also have beliefs about this moment and what's happening. So I want to be aware of this and I want to key into this. What people's minds tend to do is they tend to flow along the lines of what they are currently believing. So this, this second box, which I call imagination, it's, it's not entirely accurate. I've often considered changing the name of that box to mind flow. But then I, then I change my mind and go, no, I just leave it as imagination. Now, the reason being is because you know, our mind is flowing and creating stuff ongoing all the time. If that corresponds to what we think is actually going on, we call it reality. If it doesn't, we call it imagination. You know, uh, people say that's just your imagination to say your mind made that, that up, but it, it's not reality. You know, I give the example of um, my grandfather who, came back from the second world war he believed his wife my grandmother was was cheating on him she wasn't but he was paranoid he had like a like a paranoid condition and she'd go out to the store and he'd sit at home imagining like she was meeting some guy and he'd end up with with all sorts of 
unpleasant feelings as a result. Mm-hmm. And she'd come back with the bags, bags of, uh, of groceries and, and he'd you know, go, well, where, where, where have you been? Uh, I've been to the store. You know, um, now, of course, because she wasn't seeing someone, people would say, look, that's just your imagination. But if she was, people would have said, oh, wow, you know, how, how intuitive you are. How did you know? But the same thing would have been going on in his mind. It wouldn't have been any different whether the world corresponded to it or not. So this mind flow, it's just this idea that, it, that, that it's, it's the stuff that is being made by the mind. So that's box two. And it's, it's made in accordance with beliefs. You know, if I believe a tiger is about to devour me, then I'm likely to create fear and all sorts of things. Right. You know. Um, so box three, so beliefs feed this kind of mind flow or imagination. Box three is physiology because, and by the way, this is a model. These things don't happen in this neat sure. sequential order, just to be clear for people watching. Um, point three is physiology because how, when the mind moves, the body moves, whether it's in a gross way, you know, in terms of like muscles contracting this kind of thing, or whether it's just a change in um, biochemistry. So I'm a big fan of the book, How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett. She points out in there that every single concept we access changes our biochemistry. Yes. You know, because we're body budgeting all the time. So according to what we think is happening, we're going to allocate resources in different ways within the body. So physiology is always shifting. And that, that shift in physiology, we get information back from that through our senses, our external senses, and our interoceptive senses and proprioceptive senses. And that's point four on the loop, which is experience. And what mostly happens is that validates the beliefs that we had in the first place. And so, so the loop continues around. You know, if I believe my, somebody is sticking my hand to something, um, my mind starts to create it, imagination level uh, and physiology, the muscles start to contract. I have an experience of the hand locking. I, I think, oh my God, this is really happening. It feeds back in and I get pulled further and further into the loop. So if we start to shift you know, a little belief or open, open up to a little possibility, have someone imagine something to the point where they can start to experience it. They focus on it, you know, as, An- as Anthony said, he, and he's been on the podcast, if they can focus mm. on it, you know, we can shift their beliefs, give them, give them a focus and imagination. They start to experience it. Their physiology starts to change. Yeah. And, then, and then it just starts to reinforce, right? And we're using language to feed back their experience and you call it a neuro handle, right? They'll They'll, yeah. speak, they'll speak exactly what they're experiencing. We feed that back to them and, and strengthen the response, correct? That's, that's how I do it, yeah. So if we go back to, to my example of the, the Tai Chi, the tai Chi mm-hmm. guru, the wannabe Tai Chi guru doing the MT4 stuff with me, if he could have, and I'm not saying he did this, but if he'd have said, so what are you experiencing right now? And I'd have said, you know, my hand is, is, is locked solidly. If he'd have fed that back to me, locked solidly, and you know this, right? Yes. Right now, I, that's, that's an amplifying. So I use a lot of this in my work. I'll feed stuff back in to draw somebody more fully into that experience and amplify it more within their, within their system because I want to get that loop. I'm, I'm encouraging that loop to spin, so to speak. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, so we'll go to pacing and leading in just a moment because that's kind of what you're doing here. But I want to, I want to touch on framing first. Hmm. so when we frame something it's the it's the the box we put ourselves in right that maybe we're pretending um to have an experience or or um a frame right and so a hypnosis is, is often framed as like this mind control game where it's your willpower against against the subject right and so you totally yeah. flip the script on that frame and uh tell me how you present that to to people that are going to have an experience with you okay um you know, th- there's a few different ways I might do this. I might say to somebody, you know, what is it that you think hypnosis is about? And they're going to tell me, obviously. So I'm going to get some information on their beliefs. I want to know what their beliefs are. Now, um, 
if I was working with somebody and I was doing some street hypnosis and they said, well, I know what hypnosis is about because I've been hypnotized before, I'd say, okay, well, tell me about that because I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to waste that material if it's, if it's there. But if they're telling me, well, you know, I'm not sure I've seen Darren Brown on telly or, or whatever it will be, I'm probably going to blow the whole thing out. Now, this is, this is not what I was taught. I was taught whatever somebody believes hypnosis is, you, you take that and you run with it and you go with it. But I actually found that people often have really unuseful beliefs. Mm -hmm. And they might have a combination of beliefs that's not useful, which is hypnosis is mind control and only weak-minded people have their mind controlled and I'm not a weak-minded person. So a combination of those beliefs is going to cause problems for engagement. So what I will often do in a situation like that is I'll say, you know, the, the real truth is hypnosis doesn't really exist. At least not like you see in TV and films. So there's a little, there's a little kind of double, double punch there. Mm -hmm. The first of all is this is if I'm somebody, you know, knows me as a hypnotist in that moment. The last thing they expect the hypnotist to say is hypnosis doesn't really exist. So they go, huh? And then I'll leave a beat for them to go, what? And I say, at least not like you see in TV and films. So they'll go, huh? So now they, they're sort of like, oh, it does exist, but I don't know anything about it. Or it's like, so we've created a space to redefine it in a useful way. At which point I'll, I'll just say anything that's going to get engagement, um, which might be something as simple as, Hypnosis is really just the ability of your mind to connect into different experiences that you might not normally pay attention to. Um, and I might get some reason. I say, you know, and when we do this, it enables us to make some useful shifts and changes that we can't do in our normal kind of state of attention or reality. Now, if you analyze what I've just said, it's all fairly meaningless stuff. <laughs> you know, it's I, I, I caught some, subtle, some subtleties in there that are pretty powerful, though. Yeah, because I'm not looking at the. I'm not looking to communicate information at that point. Um, I'm just looking to start drawing the person in a particular right. direction and get them nodding along and going, "Oh, okay, that that makes sense." I don't but care whether it does or not, but <laughs> you're also framing it as a subtle cooperation, right? When we go yeah. into this experience, right? You're not saying, you know, when I put you into this, uh, which right? Is, which is, you know, a pretty powerful little subtle frame shift. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, maybe this is partly. Again, I'm, I'm not good with people telling me what to do, yeah. me personally. So, <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't work for me. So may, uh, maybe I just project that on other people. But it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read Michael Pantalon's book, Instant Influence. Have you ever read that? I think I, I, think I have. It's been, it's so, been um, a few years about it, but yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I really like it. I recommended it to Mike Mandel and Chris Thompson. They absolutely loved it. And they took a load of the stuff and put it into their their framing for some of their processes um and it's got some nice bits of business but there's and that's a kind of research-based piece of work instant influences and there's michael pantalon i'm terrible with remembering research but he shares the research that demonstrates that the more you respect people's autonomy the more they relax and just open themselves to your influence mm -hmm. so as long as there's, there shouldn't be any barrier for a, hip, you know, if a hypnotist, if somebody who calls themselves a hypnotist or someone who wants to be a professional influencer of any kind, um, if they recognize this, there's no reason not to put frames in place to have people relax and think, that's oh, all right, I'm not being coerced and manipulated. I'm completely free to do whatever I, I want to do. And then they relax and they stop pushing back and that critical faculty is willing to go and take a back seat. Now, of course, the only barrier to this is if somebody has a need, and I have met some hypnotists who have a need for the client to believe they're being controlled by them for, for some reason. It's just like an egoic thing, I guess. Yeah. yeah. You know, but um, it, it can get in the way. And, and of course, sometimes some people actually like to be dominated like that. So that might work as a frame for them. But generally, I'll pick that frame, which is much more about, look, um, we're in this together. We are co-creating this experience. And I'm not necessarily going to explicitly say these things, but I am going to implicitly have that embedded in my framing. 
So I say things often like, I'm just going to invite you to move your mind in different ways. I use a line like that. I'm going to invite you to move your mind in different ways. Not, I'm going to make you cluck like a chicken or right. you know, anything like that. So it is very cooperative sort of frame. And in the book, I use the phrase, instead of hypnotist and hypnoty or the old school hypnotist and subject kind of language, I talk about operator and, and co-operator. Uh, where cooperator is like a co-pilot. So I've got this kind of image of the pilot and the co-pilot there in my mind. I don't share that with clients, but the reason that I put that, I kind of really brought that out front and center in the book is because I wanted people reading it to really get that idea. If they're going to go out, they're going to be either doing hypnotic phenomena work or change work or just general influencing work. You know, the less grabby you are about controlling people, the more it's, it's ironic, the more space you give people, the more open to influence they become. And, you know, it, it works counts to how people think it's going to. Absolutely. And I think that that cooperator and operator frame is is really important, um, you know, especially when you're doing some some of the more sensitive things like like coaching and, and therapy and, and things like mm. that. Um, so. Let's get into pacing and leading and leading a bit because I think those are kind of at the core of a lot of hypnotic language and, and the way that I teach hypnotic influences, um, you know, once you're in rapport with somebody, uh, so you're in rapport and then whoever has the most certainty becomes the influencer. And then as you guide their focus, they have an experience. And so a lot of your language patterns and a lot of the way you frame it ties in perfectly where rapport is meeting somebody where they are, right? Getting into, I, mm. I call it energetic sinking. And then we can just, we guide their focus with leading, right? So, so tell us a little bit about pacing and leading, how to use it in, in demonstrational hypnosis, but also just in life in general and, and conversations and influence. Right. Um, so pacing and leading happens on a lot of levels. And the most basic level for me is the kind of energetic level. Now, mm -hmm. we kind of talked about energy and chi and stuff like that earlier on. And I think people have a, have a kind of a simplistic idea about it. It's either real or it's not real rather than, okay, look, what we're doing is we're finding ways to talk about stuff that is not only more complex than we think, but it's more complex than we can think. So um, I've got a four-month-old puppy right now, and he loves people. And whenever he sees people, his tail starts going like a helicopter, and his back ends wagging. He's always really, really thrilled to see people. Now, about, I don't know, two months in, when we got him back home and everything, we hired this dog trainer because... We wanted to make sure we got the dog well trained. So we get this expert in and she's a, she's a master, got a master's degree in animal psychology. So the interesting thing was, is the buzzer went and she came to the door for the first time. And I opened the door and Otto, my dog, he goes to run forward and then he stopped. I saw the moment happen. She just kind of went, like this and went into some kind of mode. I don't know what it was, right? Well, I, I can guess what it was. And he stopped and froze and backed right up and hid behind my leg. And he's never done this. He'd never done this with anyone before and he's never done it with anyone since. And I'm thinking, this is the professional dog trainer. What's just happened here? Mm -hmm. She has done something weird. And what she did is she pattern interrupted the natural unfolding of rapport that would have happened and the reason being is she's very much a, a sort of behaviorist uh, dog psychologist so for her a relationship is just another set of behaviors to be trained so she went straight into training mode she pulled out these treats and started like doing this thing and of course he loves treats but that's not what a relationship is mm -hmm. so if she'd have been a little bit more alive to the moment and just alive to how he was responding and how she met him so that there was a, a kind of synchronization a kind of resonance for me that's the basis of pacing first and foremost you want to get the kind of syncing that kind of resonance stephen gilligan uses this phrase limbic resonance which I, is poetic pseudoscience but i like it a lot um 
you know, and, and I think it's kind of been interesting for me training the dog as well, because a lot of this behavioral stuff, you know, the, the, um, the uh, operant conditioning and the classical conditioning stuff, I'm, it's legitimate. It has its place. But for me, it's not the baseline. So I love to go out and I walk the dog. And if he's sniffing and I want to go, let's go. I don't want to have to have a cue that's been conditioned in. I'm always curious as to how much can I get him to do what I want? just non-verbally, just by kind of being present and by doing non-verbal pacing and leading with the dog, because the dog doesn't have language, instead of treating him like a machine to be programmed. Mm -hmm. So for me, pacing and leading, it's like, so you want, you know, you want somebody flowing along with reality. You've got to flow along with them. You've got to be showing them, not consciously, but outside of consciousness, that you're in sync with them. And yes, sometimes what you say can help with that. So much of the time, it's just the kind of like, you know, I can't, there's no, there's no way to talk about this scientifically. It's where their energy's at. It's where their, you know, where their vibe's at, this kind of thing. And, and, you know, how grounded can you be with that? How can you meet that in a way that is, um, you know, is generative? I don't necessarily believe if somebody's all nervous, you should pace them by being all nervous. I don't, that's, that's the kind of idea I learned in, early on in NLP, which sort of makes sense to a certain degree. But I think, you know, I like to bring a little bit more grounding a little bit more quickly mm -hmm. with, with people. Um, it's, yeah. It's funny because you probably don't know this, but I'm doing <clears throat> my first event uh, at the end of October and it's called Resonance. And that's kind of the framework is, you know, that energetic syncing and leading and influencing from there. Um, kind of as the one of the underlying principles of everything in the universe, right? Is this idea that <clears throat> everything is energy everything's got a frequency. And, and when you apply that to influence systems, uh, you know, influence outcomes, you got to meet the person, you know, you got to connect with them and flow with them. Like you said, mm. uh, versus like pushing, forcing that doesn't come from, and, and even I'd say judgment, right? When you judge someone, I think you lose that energetic yeah. sinking as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I haven't run this for, for a few years now, but I used to run a weekend workshop called the Hypnosis Skills Boot Camp. And what I would do is for at least up until lunchtime on the first day, just be a two-day workshop, I wouldn't let anyone use any words. So they come along and they think, right, well, I'm going to learn hypnosis. And people have this idea that it's all about the words. It's all mm -hmm. about the words. So what I would do is I'd spend the morning starting off with nonverbal pacing. So I do a very, very simple drill where you have people partnered up and you stand there and somebody walks towards you. And the idea is, is as they walk towards you, you just kind of flow out the way to one side, but you, you don't jump out the way. You don't wait to the last minute. You've got to kind of really move with them. So it's almost like you're allowing their movement to move you and you flow out the way and you flow out the way. And I get people doing this um, and then I do it a bit. And then I, I'm flowing and then I just, I just kind of do a lifting and a drop. And every time people, they stop and I go, you, you stopped. I say, yeah. I say, how come? And they go, uh, because, and you get different answers. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's, I don't know. And sometimes it's, uh, because I guess that's what you wanted me to do. Uh, you know, but, but there's no conscious explanation because it's, it's not been done with words. It's been done with nonverbal pacing and leading um, and then I sort of get people to do that and then stop in different ways using different energies get people to stop either sort of sort of get them to go heavy or go light and then start to shift their position or start to get hands moving and get and there's no right or wrong it's just like let's get as much stuff happening as we possibly can before we start using words so by the time we get round to the afternoon and people are now using the words, it's, it's in addition to this base level stuff. Now, I think the problem with starting to teach hypnosis straight in at the level of language is that's where people are. They're up in their head trying to remember these language patterns or trying to act like a hypnotist or talk like a hypnotist or something like that instead of being really, really present with that person. So that's, um, that's the way I like to 
approach teaching hypnosis. I don't know anybody else that does that. I'm sure there's probably some people out there that do it, but something similar. Yeah. So you did um, at HypnoThoughts, you did a, a similar exercise where you told people to keep walking. And then I remember you stood in front of them and one time you just put your hand out and, yeah. and, they, and they stopped. Right. And the other time yeah. you stepped out of the way and it was like, well, you know, I told you to keep walking. Why did you stop? And it was the, the body language communicates much more mm. a lot of times in our words. And, and, and throughout your book, you've got examples of where you tell people to lift their foot, but you're, or maybe you did this live, but you're pointing down, right. And you're pushing, yeah. you're putting a little weight in your, and your foot's locked down where theirs is. And you tell them to try to lift it, but all of your body language is, is pointing in the opposite of what your language is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I often, when I'm doing something like a foot stick piece, I'm very interested in the dynamism. So people call it a foot stick, but I'm more interested in, I want direction. I want something happening, um, not a static state like your foot is stuck. So mm -hmm. I'll, be, I'll be directing the attention downwards. I've often got a hand up on the shoulder, which these, I, I can't remember the last time I had to really do anything with that hand. But again, it's still a nonverbal communication because I'm not pushing or shoving but there's still a point of touch mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and a direction being indicated, which is so subtle. It's outside of consciousness. Their eyes are down on their toes and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of lent down there looking and getting complete fixation on that point. And I'll say, and I'll say something like, you know, go ahead, try and unstick that foot. And every time I say stick, my body language is doing this jamming it into the ground. So I try and unstick it, find it just sticks more deeply down, more deeply. The more you focus in, the more deeply. Now, if I said the more you focus in, in, the more they go in in that direction, literally that spatial direction, the more weight goes down on the foot, the more it's... So I'm looking at, I call that the belt and, belt and braces approach. For, for you guys in the States, it would be the belt and suspenders approach. You know, you've got, you're making sure the pants are support, definitely... yeah. 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 So I, I want to look at the experience I want to have or the result that I want to have and how many different ways can I make that happen? Uh, can, I, can I lead their body so their body weight comes into that foot as well as giving the suggestions of sticking and all of this kind of thing? And what, what tools do I have to do that aside from just words? So for people that don't understand, <clears throat> you know, uh, I have a lot of entrepreneurs. Some people have entry-level hypnosis and some that listen to this are, hypno are hypnotists, but for those that don't understand everything that just went into what you described, you're in rapport with them. You're, you're feeding their language back. You're pacing their experience. You're leading them to a new experience. Hmm. You're giving them body language that deepens their experience, right? And you're, and you're mirroring and pacing and leading with body language as well. You're mm -hmm. using presuppositions. You're constantly calibrating what they're doing. Um, hmm. you're, embed you're embedding commands. And so there's so many things going on here that I know to get to that level of success, you, I mean, you've had thousands and thousands of repetitions so that for you, it's just kind of like one thing that you do and, and your subconscious yeah. does everything, right? So communicate, getting from knowing all of these separate things to like actually using them to create an experience. Right. Um, as you say that, I'm thinking about somewhere in the Tai Chi classics, it says you must do it with one chi. Um, and I know what they mean by that because Tai Chi, Tai Chi is a, a fiddly old art. It's not, you know, I love boxing. I love Muay Thai. And there's a lot of, you know, you can get real high art with that. But Tai Chi's got a lot of bits and pieces, a lot of details that you've got to put together. And if you can't just do it like that, if they don't fully synchronize, you're not going to make it work. It's not mm -hmm. a fast learning art. It's the same with hypnosis in my view. Now, I want to just say, you can get a lot of stuff happening quickly. I've had people, many people contact me and say, I watched one of your YouTube videos. I did it with my uncle and it completely worked, you know, and they're blown away. Now, that doesn't mean that they've got a high level of skill and they're going to hit that every single time. Nobody right. hits it every single time. Um, but there is, there are a lot of layers and I'm fully aware that I'm a geek for skills. So I love the process of learning and developing the skills. I love that revisiting over and over again. I, I think this is unusual. I was just saying to somebody about this yesterday that most people I meet in martial arts, they just want somebody to tell them what to do. They're not really doing any of their own problem solving. So they go, well, how do I do this? 
How do I do that technique? They're not looking and going, okay, so what's happening here? And how can I make this work better? Mm-hmm. What are the, you know, so, so I'm always asking these questions about anything that I'm learning. I've had some fantastic teachers, but I've never seen it as their responsibility to instruct me in the correct way. For me, they're just resources. They're, they're sources of information, information, they're sources of perspective. In the end, I want to keep looking at it and keep solving the problem. It's like a puzzle box. So a lot of the, the sort of pieces that I've done over and over and over again, like foot sticks or hand sticks or uh, uh, name amnesias or invisibility pieces, a lot of these stock street noses pieces, I've approached those from a variety of different perspectives. And I'm always looking at, at any little bit of business that's going to add an extra percent to my hit rate or something like that. You know, if I, if I had a 50% hit rate, what can I do to take it to 51? What can I do to take it to 55, to 60, to... It's just the details, the details, the details. Um, now, I don't do street hypnosis anymore. You know, I'm, I'm kind of did it enough and I'm done with that phase. And some people say, oh, James, you don't do it anymore. Why not? Because I'm done with that phase. And in a sense, it's kind of pointless. It doesn't really achieve much in life. It has done for me, but I think it's a great place to learn things about people Mm -hmm. and about communication in general um things that you can take with you in your real life so to speak you know so i'm a lot a lot lot better at running generative business meetings than i used to be because of the way that i've learned to think and approach things the way i've learned to layer in different levels in communication you know not because i've got a set way of doing it but because of the skills that come from that. So I think it's a really fantastic thing to do. I'm fully aware that most people who were, say, entrepreneurs probably wouldn't. You know, if I said to an entrepreneur, look, what you want to do is you want to get out and do some street hypnosis. Right. They they would quite rightly say, no, I don't, (laughs) you know. Um, So, but the, the other thing I'll say about this, I did this coaching group called The Magician's Journey last year, and I made it clear Now, this is about being a magician. And I said to everyone in the group, you can take this literally or metaphorically. I don't really mind, you know, what is magic apart from high craft? You know, you get you get stuff happening in that that special way. And I made it really, really clear at the beginning of that. I said each and every one of you is currently the magician that you are. And at the end of this, you will be the magician that you have become. You will not be me. And I do not want you to be me. I am the magician that I am. And I am the magician that I am becoming. You know, I do everything that I do and nothing that I don't at the moment. So for me, this stuff, when you get into it, and whether it's martial arts, whether it's hypnosis, whether it's anything, it's you will be at your best when you fully embody the stuff that works for you, the insights, the understandings, the approaches. It's not that there's a definitive correct way for people to do it. You know, so I... I, when I teach people, I'm always saying to people, look, take what's useful for you. Take the inspiration, the ideas, take the things that you can make work. Do not try and emulate me. You cannot be me. I couldn't be anyone I'm teaching. I couldn't do hypnosis the way they do. So that's, that's a really important thing for me. Yeah, I love it. I think, you know, without, I think it's great to, to learn from someone like you or Mandel or, you know, the Jack wins and, start to use, you know, start off using their language and their patterns and then find how it suits your, your voice and your hypnotic skills and, and adapt it to, to your personality. Right. Cause then it's, it's more mm. authentic. You're more congruent with it. And I think you have, you have more of an impact. Um, so awesome, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Let's, we can start wrapping it up. I have um, a, a quick question. So you kind of talked about, you know, your, your new way of thinking from all this time on doing street hypnosis and so I always look for, you know, I coached wrestling for years and, you know, I was a, 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 had some, some fights as well. And, and it's not about the moves as much as like understanding the principles, right? Yeah. Cause once you know the principles of angles and speed and um, space, you're, you're more effective with whatever move it is. And so I guess maybe what are some of the, the higher level principles that your journey with hypnosis and magic and, and Tai Chi 
uh, have brought into your perspective, your, your perceptual filters on life? Well, you know, it's a lot like wrestling, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, for me, it's all about this moment. Everything comes back to this moment. There is no moment like this moment. So what I always want to do, and I think this is, you get, you'll get this in wrestling as well. Like if you've got an idea that you try and force onto the moment, yeah, maybe it'll come off. Mm -hmm. But if it does, you got lucky because you were trying to force a preconception onto this moment. Instead of actually, you can bring an idea to the moment and see how it meets that moment. But you've got to be alive to the moment. What is it that's actually happening right now? So my start point for anything, particularly if I'm doing something like, uh, like any kind of martial arts stuff or any kind of influencing stuff or whatever, it's what is it that's happening right now? What can I use in this moment? Um, I used to, when I used to teach martial arts, you know, people would look at something like a hip throw. They go, I can see how that works. Yeah, it's just like a, it, it's, it's leverage. It's obvious how that works. And then they go to try and execute this hip throw on somebody who had a little bit more skill than them. And it will be them that would end up mm -hmm. on their ass because they were trying to apply this big idea, whole form. So I used to say to people, think small. The first thing you want to do is, okay, you're touching. You want to, where is this person? You know, where's their center of balance? Where, you know, where, where do they want to move easily? Where don't they want to move easily? Th these sorts of things. Then introduce, you know, get a sense, well, how might I want to change the vector here? Introduce some kind of force. See how that starts to move things. And how can you then go with this movement? Where might you want to put like, a, like an obstacle in the way if you're going to put your hip in the way? Where and when? Ah, now. Because they're already falling. So, you know, we, we've half done it or whatever it might mm -hmm. be. So that's, that's the thing that's really important to me is, you know, be present in the moment, feel what's happening. Another thing I would say is, you know, think small is, is my principle there, but also slow down a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, in martial arts, a lot of the time, people are trying to be faster and faster and faster. They're trying to beat the other guy in terms of speed. And I'm not saying slow down completely so, so you're ineffective, but most people can afford to slow down some. They can afford to slow down when they're communicating. They can afford to slow down when they're influ influencing. They can afford to allow a bit more space sometimes. So I'd say that, you know, that's an important thing. But be aware. I just talked about slowing down, but, you know, be aware of, of, of when you want to give people time and when you want to take it away, you know, when you want to give people thinking time and when you want to take it away, you know, it be, be paying attention, be alive. Are they flowing in the direction that you want? If they are, maybe give them some space and time to let what's, what's, a, what's unfolding in their mind flourish. If their critical faculty is kicking in, you might want to be taking away thinking time and space at that point, you know, like, oh, um, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, just some some pattern interrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, these kinds of things are, are principles. I would say always, always be grounded. Um, that's a huge thing. So people buy what's solid. And if you're not solid, they're not going to buy you. So if you're going to influence, you've got to be grounded. Mm -hmm. You've got to have that, that, that groundedness. Uh, about you and I think that's uh, that's something that it's the trick of also being authoritative or grounded without being authoritarian you know so it's just like you can you can keep that you can be directive you can give people what seems like a lot of space and a lot of freedom you're not bossing people about but at the same time it's not it's not about being um like well you know you you can do what whatever you want really you could put your hand here or there you know that's not that's not going to work being a leader without being a tyrant right yeah being a leader without being a tyrant authoritative without being authoritarian it's just kind of finding that that blend so you know you might want to get someone to put their hand down you go hmm you left or right-handed you know it, 
it's not bossing and it's asking. It's it's not, you know, it's like uh, I'm left-handed. I'll tell you what, we do this with the right. So I'm kind of like, uh, I look like some people might go, well, that's being hesitant. But my energy is grounded while I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm actually just pantomiming a bit of evaluation in my mind because if I pantomime evaluation, they're gonna they're gonna think, well, there's something for real going on here because otherwise he wouldn't have to think about it, would he? So, um, so yeah, th- this this kind of stuff uh, this kind of stuff comes in a lot. I, I would also say, if this one piece of advice I was going to give anybody when it comes to influence, which hypnosis is, it's about influence, is Pay attention to your ground of being first. Every single time, your ground of being first. And I learned this years ago from doing street hypnosis, uh, doing close-up magic, this kind of thing. If you go up to a group of new people, you have to become the leader of their group immediately. And they don't know who you are. They haven't asked you to come over. They're not hanging around going, oh, I wish somebody had come up and hypnotized me, or I wish someone had come up and do some magic for me. So they, they don't need you. They don't want you. And you have, to, you have to go in and become the leader straight away. Now, the very, very first time that I went up to somebody who I didn't know to do some magic, never done it before, people I didn't know, I went up to these two guys in a bar in the town I lived. And I went up and I said, um, excuse me, um, I'm just learning some. That's as far as I got. And the guy just turned around and said, you know, keep it clean. He said, F off, mate. Okay. So I walked away. Now I thought to myself, what did I do there? I brought doubt. I brought insecurity. You know, I brought all of, all of my fears. I brought them. And that's what I got back. So I call that the, uh, the picnic principle. Be careful what you take to the picnic because it may well be what you end up eating. And, uh, and that's what happened there. So I, I, you know, I learned to, to go up to people and go, hey, guys, um, you know, or I do nonverbal stuff. When I was doing card magic, I would, I'd have a deck of cards like this, and I'd stand in a big group of people. I'd kind of look at them, and I'd wait till I catch someone's eye, and they'd look over at me, and I, I'd just go like that. And they go, because they wouldn't understand. they go, what? What? And I go, oh, and I come over and go, cars. I go, what's the most interesting thing that's happened to you this evening? And they go, ah, uh, and then I'm in. So, you know, I'm just going straight in, They're using a nonverbal distance thing, but it's all about your ground of being. That's what people will buy. That's what they will accept. That's what they will reject straight off the bat. Well, it's just like when we're hypnotizing somebody, we're feeding their experience back to them. You know, when we go up to a, a group of strangers, they're going to feed our emotions back to us with their response, right? And so, yeah, having that that certainty and confidence and playfulness or whatever it is uh, will either open up or, or close you off to to uh, to those groups and influence. Yes, there's there's a whole load more I could say on that topic, but I'm aware of the I'm aware of the time <laughs> yeah. we got. So well, we've been going for a bit. Well, I appreciate your time, James. And again. Uh, Hypnosis Without Trance, fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Uh, If you want anything to do with hypnosis, um, demonstration hypnosis, or even just understanding language patterns for influence, it's a a brilliantly written book. So highly recommend it. James, I'm looking forward to seeing you speak, hopefully at HypnoThoughts or somewhere in the next few years here as the world opens up. Comes back to life, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it'd be nice. Um, it's, It's been a strange couple of years. Normally I'm traveling around the globe, but... Here I've been sat mostly in this chair on Zoom for, yeah, for the last couple of years now. So I could throw my computer out the window and not be too upset about it. Yeah, um, but this has been brilliant. Well, thank you again so much, and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you having me on.